This is Alan. This is Brandon. And welcome to Dice Over Everything, the miniatures gaming podcast. So lately, something new actually came out that I guess you could kind of play without meeting up with people, but it's probably one of those things that's better off with others, but you can do alone. Uh, yeah, uh, and it's something that I've been really looking forward to for a long time because it's a, a kind of a, a spinoff, or, or you could say say a, yeah, like a spinoff of my favorite current game, uh, and that is... For those watching, yeah, you, you have it to Are hold you gonna up. Are going to say it? Oh, it's... For those that are listening? It's, Fro- it's Frostgrave, but another grave has come out, and that is, yes, Stargrave. For it, the stars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I just got this, my, my book. Uh, it's been out for a little while, but there were some distribution issues in, in uh, Canada, so it took a little while to get to us. Uh, and I did kind of break down and uh, start reading the uh, online version, buying the PDF version, uh, which you can also get. So if you have distribution problems wherever you are, just you can get it online. Uh, but yeah, this game came out, and... Uh, I was able to play a couple of single player games, even though, uh, you know, the full multiplayer version of the game is out of reach for us because of COVID. Uh, And I was really impressed, actually. It kind of exceeded my expectations. Okay, because from what I've heard, it's basically just the sci-fi version of Frostgrave. And I guess for- Yes, I guess it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, but by virtue of that, okay, first of all, I, let me get my biases out there. I did say it's a, a sequel or a spinoff of my favorite game. So, uh-huh. so if it's as good as uh, Frostgrave, then that's really good. Yeah. So from our perspective, we're we're cool with like fantasy miniatures or sci-fi miniatures. Uh-huh. So it's not like it being set in either like setting would like uh-huh. stop us or encourage us to play more one way or the other. Uh, I don't know if that's actually true. I think one of the, the biggest things with Stargrave actually is that it is space themed. So you and would... why do we play miniatures, right? It's not just a game. If it was just a game, mm-hmm. we could tomorrow we could switch to a computer game, right? Because you know, maybe a computer game has better gameplay, then we'd switch there. But it's not just a computer game. What's great about Stargrave, Frostgrave, all of these other games that we play is because they're miniature games. There, you, you get to play physically on a tabletop and you know push your guys around. And specifically for Frostgrave and Stargrave, it has a campaign kind of RPG-ish uh, feel where your your war band grows and becomes stronger and becomes your own through both the uh, things they accumulate, the experiences they get, and sometimes the injuries that they take. So this kind of thing is like wrapped up uh, in these kind of uh, of uh, in these kind of games. All right. So I guess from your perspective, you kind of enjoy the, the campaign settings of things, which yep. Frostgrave and this game you're saying both do. <clears throat> yep. So so do you want me to just run through basically give you the the I guess we've we've touched on a bunch of things, but give you the five sh- second spiel of what Stargrave is, as yeah, sure. if you don't don't know anything about Frostgrave. So the, the really short one is it's Frostgrave in space, right? But if you don't know what Frostgrave is, this is basically a skirmish miniatures game where you put on like uh, 10 miniatures and you you play uh, a, a bunch of, um, I guess, uh, what do you call Self-tree, it? Like a, a firefly kind of crew, mm-hmm. like a crew of um, mercenaries that is running around in a uh, world that has been basically a post-apocalyptic uh, world where the, these, the main civilizations have collapsed and now uh, basically the world is run by pirate fleets uh, or the remains of the world is run by pirate fleets and you're just a mercenary company trying to gather your resources and survive and make money and become rich. So you think about it as, mm-hmm. sorry? You're gangsters in space. Yes, exactly. You're basically a bunch of gangsters in space. Uh, I think you're not as as really as evil as uh, a normal gangster. You're you're more, you're more like a a mercenary kind of uh, free company. If you think about mm-hmm. it, they're just you just look maybe treasure hunters, right? You're trying to gather the uh, the remains of, of this war thing and just trying to like sell them sell them to get rich and build up your your crew. Mm-hmm. 
So that's kind of the setting. And because of that, you know, you, every game you play against other pirate crews trying to like salvage all this, those resources, build themselves up while evading the, the pirates, which is the, the, that might come in after, after you and trying to gather whatever you're doing. So you're trying to fight over the salvage, uh, treasures, all this valuable stuff uh, with other crews that are like you, these scavengers, uh, and then grab them and then escape before um, these pirate crews descend on your place and you know uh, take it from themselves, basically. Mm -hmm. And so just like um, that kind of setting, like if you think about the movie Firefly or uh, you think about uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca in, uh, in Star Wars, right? You're, you're just kind of a rough and tumble group of, of guys with a bunch of weapons and maybe your, your, your main characters have, uh, you know, they're exceptional people to gather these other mercenaries around them, right, with special powers. And mm -hmm. so th those are your basically uh, your heroes, right? And you play as one of uh, two, well, you have two characters, basically, and then a bunch of basically henchmen, right? Yeah, so from what I'd heard, like the your main characters take on the role of kind of like your sci-fi tropes of like, yeah. Of like your leaders you see or like your main movie yeah. characters and sci-fi tropes so whether it might be like yeah. a Jedi, whether it might be like some sort of oh, what else like a space marine almost where he's yeah you can be a you can be a, a a veteran or you can be a han solo type or you can be like a cyborg right mm -hmm. so these are the, the the type of uh like you said space sci-fi mm -hmm. tropes um where basically your captain and your first mate of your small starship, right, uh, are your main characters, right? And everyone else are just grunts that you hire on for the job, or maybe they stick with you for a while, but they're mostly just there to like support your captain, your first mate. So it's not about leveling all of them. It's really about like leveling up your, your, your captain, captain, your first mate. Yep. Yep. And Actually, you can't level anyone else. So... In Frostgrave, you could give them gear, which meant you kind of cared about them because they became mm -hmm. like worth their gear. Yep, same so kind of way. So the same kind of way you give them equipment and if they fall, they can also fall injured, as you said before. Yep. Yeah, they can either fall injured or they can be taken out uh, if they're if they die, right? So so like I said, there's it's, it's these games are very narrative focused, right? They're supposed to, when you play against an opponent, right? You're, you're not, the point of, the, of each mission is not to kill your opponent, right? Okay. Which makes it very different than your normal miniatures games where like, you know, it's just enacting a, a war scene where you're just trying to defeat your opponent and kill them. In uh, Stargrave and in Frostgrave, the, the game it's based on, um, instead of the objective being killing your opponent, uh, it's actually, there's a bunch of treasures on the table, or sometimes a scenario will have specific things you're trying to do for that mission. And you don't even have to necessarily even take a shot at your opponents, right? Uh, to be able to come out and win, quote unquote win, right? But even winning is is relative speaking, right? Because the point of the game is generally to pick up as many treasures as possible and get off the table with the treasures, right? But after you're done that, you actually roll for the treasures and what, what's inside the treasure is actually random. So along with the experience you get for just doing the mission and stuff like that and just surviving the battle and doing stuff, uh, you could come away with, let's say, uh, one treasure and the opponent could come away with three treasures, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about it in a normal kind of uh, game that's not necessarily thematic based, uh, the guy that got three treasures obviously won, right? He got three, you got one. Yeah, that'd be the point. But, yeah, in a normal kind of way, right? But with Stargrave, because the entire point is a campaign system where you pick up treasures, it's not just about getting more treasures it's what you got in those treasures right they become actual valuable because then you roll on a chart and you see what the treasure is and sometimes if you roll badly you could get three treasures and you could get way less or something way less valuable than the opponent who got one treasure right? mm -hmm. and then on top of that uh the things that bet you benefit you are the experience that you get right but most of the experience is not from killing your opponent right in fact some of the experience is even getting killed if one of your guys gets reduced to zero life, you get experience for that, 
So right? one of your crew members or one of your two? Yes, leaders? one of your crew members is reduced to zero life, mm -hmm. which is generally a bad thing in the game because you just lost a guy. It, he doesn't necessarily die forever, but during that mission, right? If he was reduced to zero life and has to make a death check after the game, then you get experience for that, right? Uh -huh. And your crew, your, your entire force gets experience for that. And this is one of those things that I found interesting is that um, the experience basically in Frostgrave, the, the the game this is based on, it all goes, all the experience goes to your wizard because the game that game is all about your wizard, right? This mm -hmm. one though, and then your apprentice is basically a mini wizard, right? It's a duplicate, yeah. Yeah, it's a duplicate, but slightly yeah. worse, mm -hmm. right? Whereas in Stargrave, instead, how it goes is that your first mate and your captain are entirely different characters. So instead of having like a captain and then a mini captain, right? Like, as in, you know, like in Frostgrave, it's a wizard and a mini wizard. I thought you were going to say Stargrave. Like powers, but yeah. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Like, or like Austin Powers. powers. <laughs> yes. Um, instead, you literally just have two characters. And one character is a level 15 character and one character is a level zero character. At level 51, it starts out as your captain. And instead, when you get your experience, you actually allocate who gets the experience at the end of the game. Mm. So if you, you get 300, you get a maximum of 300 per game, right? You can, you can say, I want to make my captain. So like, I want my captain to become better, but that means that my uh, first mate is not going to be getting better. So it doesn't right? actually or matter the opposite. what they do in game in terms of how it gets allocated? No. Nope. Okay. So you just gather experience for the overall game. Uh, so for your for your crew, and then you allocate it who you want to level up, basically, either your first mate or your captain at the end. Mm -hmm. So I found that it really, that actually is like, I, I know a lot of people online, you know, saying the differences and the things that make this game, even though it's just star, uh, Frostgrave in space, making it a space game changes it a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally it's 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 uh, Frostgrave in space, but there are a lot of changes, right? And this is one of them that it seems like a small tweak, but it has a large repercussions in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Because in front, like just, it basically means you play with two wizards, right? If, if this were Frostgrave, it'd be the same as playing with two wizards as opposed to a wizard and an apprentice. And so it changes the kind of, idea the way you think about the characters right and the way they level up and i think it really works with the other differences of the game to make it really feel like a a space you know kind of a space cowboy kind of thing oh another another characters that <laughs> that you could relate it to cowboy mm -hmm. bebop okay yeah, i don't I've know if watched that online i've heard it's good but it's basically a crew of of guys treasure hunters whatever mercenaries running around on a spaceship trying to make money and build themselves up that's who you are yep so at first thought of one being sci-fi and the other being like fantasy you uh -huh. expect there to be more guns in mm. the sci-fi version is that yeah that pretty much true yeah actually that is i think if you've heard a lot of other people talk about Stargrave, that is what they always mention. And it is true. It changes the game entirely because in Stargrave, uh, so in Frostgrave, you guns are basically at a, a premium in, in Stargrave, uh, sorry, in Frostgrave two, second edition, right? Mm -hmm. You can have a maximum of your eight guys, from your eight guys, you can have a maximum of four of them being having guns. And if they have guns, if you take guys with guns, then you won't necessarily have the guys that are really good in close combat, right? Yep. Uh, in Stargrave, um, everyone has a gun. The lowliest guy, I think only one guy you can get, the guard dog, does not have a gun. Every single other person, your lowliest of the low, has a gun. There is a character in the game, like a, a, a uh, like so your your band is ten people, right? So you have your your first mate and your uh, captain, which is like I said, is your two main characters, and then you have your 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 band that you collect right to help you go on these missions uh all all of those remaining eight guys will have guns unless you take guard guard dogs and there's even one guy uh called a medic who doesn't have a knife so they're terrible in close combat but the medic still has a pistol <laughs> so, so they can still shoot fine it's just that you know if you get in close combat they get a minus two to fight minus two damage they're gonna 
So is it more like a video game where you can take be shot over and over and still survive? Or is it more like a real Oh, game? no. This really... So this is one of the things that make it really work, I think, is that Stargrave is, I think, way deadlier than Frostgrave. Okay. So, you know, in Frostgrave, the armor levels are, are kind of higher. Uh, you can that's have why, shields that, that up your you... armor. A lot of spells improve your armor. And close combat, there's a lot of ways to get out of close combat. You can also, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, you can... Um, you can go invisible and stuff like that. Yeah, you can go invisible. And because not as many people have guns, mm -hmm. uh, and there's, I think there's actually more spells that can kind of hide people uh your maybe there's not more spells but there's there's definitely less guns right so you're you're it's it feels less deadly because you have to close in to fight right yeah so what i found in frostgrave is just have dice that roll really hot and the game becomes really deadly that's all you need yeah so and another thing with with frostgrave is that uh critical hits are not mandatory right and we don't when we play frostgrave we don't play with critical hits well uh stargrave which is when you uh, roll 20, but just you get yeah. extra damage. Yeah, you get extra damage. And so in Stargrave, um, at first I was like, do we really need critical hits? Because actually the, the thing that's really changes Stargrave actually is the stat lines of all the people. Well, the spells, right? Um, because even though it's like basically space version and your captain, your first mate have a bunch of spells, um, the big difference is that your crew uh, they're just different, right? And by by being different and having different stats and different things uh, and different equipment, uh, it changes the game a lot, right? So, like I said, the just just the gun thing by itself. Like, imagine mm -hmm. if your knight and like in Frostgrave, if your knight and your barbarian all had guns, right? And and yeah. your and your thug and your thief had guns too, right? Yeah, the, the, the barbarian's not just going to walk right up to them anymore. Yeah, just, and just actually... times before he gets there. Yeah, and actually, um, there's no one with who starts out with plus four fight. In terms of your the people you can hire, no one has plus four fight. If you're looking for someone with a good fight, it'll be your captain or your first mate. Which is the stat you use for dodging? It's the stat you use for dodging and the stat you use in close combat. Right. So some people are there's if you look at it, actually, the, the fight and shoot stats are up, actually, relatively speaking. Um, like there's a guy with, uh, you know, in, in Frostgrave, like it's basically you, if, if you switch out the, the units, right, uh, the game is going to be very different. Right. Even if the base rules of Frostgrave and Stargrave are the same, like movement, climbing, you know, mm -hmm. that's and rolling off, right? Whenever you attack someone, uh, they defend by rolling the dice and whoever has a higher number uh, wins, right? All of that is the same, but by changing what stats the units have and the equipment the units have, it changes how the game is, is played entirely, right? Like everyone has a gun, right? And, you know, a lot of people complain about the original uh, Frostgrave because they, they said, oh, if you just make an eight-man uh, team with, with eight guns, Yep. Uh, you'll just mow everyone down, right? I suspect that's partially because people never played with enough terrain. Because it's yes, it's hard to they didn't play enough with terrain, and literally that if if you did that and some guy had like a witch, you'd kind of be effed, right? Because a witch could just make fog everywhere, and then they just run at you and kill you. Mm -hmm. They just so, come and, and they just jump into your warband. Yeah, with better fighting. Yeah, so I I feel like like you know though but. But there, there is a, a, a way that it, like if you're not using the counters, right? And in, in, in Frostgrave, that could have been an issue. Well, now everyone is like that, right? Everyone has guns. Mm -hmm. And actually to balance it out, to make it there, they kind of force you into that type of gameplay because like I said, you don't have guys who are really good at close combat. There's no knight with plus four fight and 13 armor, right? The guy with, um, with, uh, like the guy that's really good at killing is really good at killing from afar, right? Yeah, so in Frostgrave, like your average hit, if you win, might cause like five damage, well, more, less than five damage. Because if you've got armor 11 on your average guy. 
on the average guy in, in Frostgrave. Yeah. I don't know if you can say um, average armor is 11, but... Okay, your basic armor is 11? Basic armor, like, there's a lot of people with no armor, which is 10. Yeah, I guess you could say 11, 12. It's 11, yeah. 12, 13. There's a, there's a mix, I'd say. Yeah, so when it depends on how you make your band, though, right? Mm-hmm. So if you okay. win a fight in Frostgrave, you, you have to roll higher on the other guy, which mm-hmm. probably means you're rolling maybe like a 14 or so when you win. But you have to add your fight. Yep. So that causes more damage to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's okay. probably around 16. So you, you honestly, Frostgrave fights end in like three rounds. Yep. That's that's pretty much if you don't want to go. Sorry, if you take three hits, you're you're probably dead. Yep, that's that's the best way to see it as opposed to numbers. I would agree. Yeah, three rounds. Yeah, this is this is the thing where like people get thrown off with the dice with the d twenty, right? They don't think about it in averages. Yeah, you could die in one hit, but on average, you die in two or three hits, right? So on average, you probably die in three hits, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. Even the toughest guy, uh, the toughest guy can take more hits, basically, like four hits, right? The weak guys, like you have the weakest guys, they die in generally two hits. Right. And then the stronger guys can do three and maybe even four. Right. But because the, the life is high and, and now this is just talking about maths and like averages and people's complaints about Frostgrave and Stargrave when they took, think about it. Uh, it's that because of the way the armor and the rolling system works, where you roll off and you add your number. And then if it's higher, then you compare it against their you that you deduct the, the guy that you hits armor. And then that's the amount of damage they do. Right. Mm-hmm. When, when you calculate it all out, um, it it basically, it's easier to think about it as like a random kind of way to either kill a, like sometimes you kill them in one hit, sometimes it takes four hits, right? Most yeah. people cannot take four hits and still survive. Even no, your knight only... is like, your knight is good because he can literally take that extra one hit, mm-hmm. right? That yeah. most people will be dead by. Yeah, even your wizard with lots of health. Because his armor isn't super high compared to your knights, yeah, it can only take yep. a couple direct hits. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, and and actually, your wizard's health is mostly about being able to cut to be able to cast spells better than it is about taking hits. Yep. So yeah, so in Stargrave, the game is definitely deadlier. So how many hits in Stargrave from like your your pistol would it take to kill your average guy? So it's a little bit. It's really, it's kind of interesting, actually. So, um, like I said, a lot of the thing that makes it feel more spacey is, like, they just have different weapons. The the first thing is, everyone has guns, right? So, even your lowliest guy has a pistol, which is, like, a short-range gun, right? It's, like, a 10-inch range gun instead of the 24-inch normal gun. Um, uh, But... uh, Everyone, most people have at least a minimum of shoot two, right? Mm -hmm. So you think about it in the normal kind of way. That means, you know, you, you roll a D20 and you add your shoot. And if it's higher than the guy's defensive roll, which is they roll a D20 and add their fight. If it's higher, then you compare it to their armor. So you mm-hmm. basically subtract the armor from whatever your roll plus your, your shoot value was. And that's the mu- how much damage you do. So um, everyone has a gun and there's sh- and shoot values of between... Like I think one guy has a shoot value of one. Most guys have a shoot value of two or three. There's a lot of guys with three. And then the sniper has a shoot value of four. So all of those numbers are up, right? Uh, And then, uh, so those are just like, if you're using your your straight weapon that just, you know, hits a guy, right? With no plus damages, um, then, Everyone, most people's armor is either 10 or 11. In fact, like light, there's only three levels of armor for, well, there's technically four, but the, for the main levels of armor, there are three. It's either nine, 10, or 11. So unlike in Frostgrave, where you have a lot of guys who are armor level 12 and 13, 11 is the normal high armor, right? But everyone has more life. So people have uh, the minimum amount it's like 12 to 14. So, so it's kind of the same as Frostgrave, except you're going to take a lot more hits because there's people are not running forward as much. They will be running and shooting you. 
Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, because you have the crit roll, right? Which means a roll of a 20 means you add plus five damage to your roll. That basically means if you roll a 20 for everyone, but like guys in super armor um, or your heroes uh, who have not taken any damage, they're going to die, right? So if, if, let's say you've got a, 10 guys in your crew and they all shoot every round. Yeah, every every two rounds, one guy will just die from a critical. Yep, basically that's what it, that's what it works out to. So every other round, even your your leader. So if your leader takes a shot from everyone else from the crew from mm -hmm. from everyone two rounds, you should expect him to be dead. So will a 19... you should have technically expected to be dead for the first time everyone unloaded on him, but you know. So will a nineteen kill most people too? Uh, let's calculate it. Nineteen plus. Let's say let's say it's a guy who's got to shoot him. Twenty two, no. It'll okay. leave him at a few health. All right. So another weak right. hit will kill him. All right. So yeah, so they will be really weak and they'll be wounded, which means they only have one action, right? But they'll take two wounds to kill. So most people can survive one hit, right? Mm -hmm. And because it's, it's another thing is that because you're shooting, like it, um, you don't get the team up bonuses, right? So in Frostgrave. Um, when you actually got into combat, it would be like a melee where a bunch of people would team up and you would often kill a guy with one hit because you have five guys piling in, right? And punching him in the face. Which in Stargrave, because everyone has ranged, the more idea is to like weaken them and shoot them down, right? Which means most people will take two hits. To yeah, because you also can't, like in Frostgrave, you may try to intercept people who are going for your weak guys mm -hmm. and like you can only fight whoever's in front of you. But if you've got guns, you just pick on the weak guy until he's gone. Whoever's yep. like a Whoever you can take out, you take out. That's just the good strategy to cut their, yeah. to cut their forces down. <clears throat> and so because, because the game feels more deadly, because you know normally in Frostgrave, you, people would be running. Like you'd have your first turn, five guys would run forward, run forward. Maybe even second turn, half your your warband is just move moving, right? Mm -hmm. Double moving. There's no combat. By the second turn, you are trading fire. You are doing attacks on the opponent. People are dying, right? Mm -hmm. a lot right so um the game really uh feels more deadly in that way right um and there's a lot of rule so so just by that it makes it feel more space combat right like gunfights it feels like gunfights right you're getting out there stormtroopers running forwards and getting shot yes and i actually don't mind the criticals as much because to me I, maybe it's just from the media that you see but like the idea of just getting shot in the head and dying feels right in a space combat game where they're firing not just like modern weaponry they're firing like super weaponry right the, your mm -hmm. normal rifle is like probably a plasma rifle right so it makes sense that people or a plasma pistol or something like that right. so it makes sense right. that if you just yeah. yeah hit them right they're just gonna die right mm -hmm. so it just feels way more like space combat and then uh they added something in where there's a lot of ways like to, to spice things up right so it's not just shooting the guy and then the, 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 they stun they they die they add he added the stun mechanic where if you do four more damage uh which is a lot more likely in stargrave because of the reduced armor but upper more life than it is in frostgrave where you're you're often more likely just to bounce off the guy right if you do four damage from shooting they become stunned and they lose, they, they're, they're reduced to one action on the next turn, basically. Okay. So it so you can actually, it's interesting, you can try, like in the in Frostgrave, you would try to uh, kill everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you basically shoot down one guy, even if you had one life to move on to the next one. But I feel like in Stargrave, there's some more incentive to lay suppressive fire, as in just do some damage to three guys so that none of them can move forward so once you get a stun off on one guy you switch to the next because you know yep. there's not a danger next round and if you do four more damage if you do four damage to someone when they become stunned uh they, it's basically the idea is that they they're diving for cover and they're not paying attention to fighting that's why they lose their action mm -hmm. but it also makes them harder to damage as well so when they've taken four damage they're stunned which means they lose an action well they're reduced to one action mm -hmm. on their next turn but they also get a plus two fight for incoming fire. Okay. So the, again, it makes it feel like you're trying to like trade fire, you know, suppress them, stop them from moving so that you can go in and do what you need to do. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And so it really like that, that worked surprisingly well. And this is just with your normal weapons. That's the equivalent of like a bow and I guess a javelin in, uh, in Frostgrave. Uh, but they added, but I guess the important part that makes like the game, even if you didn't have captains and uh, first mates and all their abilities, which are still very important, right? Mm -hmm. um, least, not least of all, because they are the best in combat of your, 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 your units. Um, they also add special weapons. And basically there are, instead of, um, I guess, bows, crossbows, and javelins for ranged weapons, right? Now, ranged combat is the norm, norm right? Um, yeah, in Frostgrave, you only have one shot per guy all the time. Yeah. So you've got some sort of crazy wizard spell. Exactly. So in um, Stargrave, they basically give, uh, there are certain units that get crazy weapons, right? Mm -hmm. So each, so instead of, um, Instead of a crossbow, there's no crossbow-like thing, but there is a shotgun. Instead of having to, uh, so the plus damage weapon is the shotgun, but mm -hmm. instead of um, having to reload, it just me it 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 uh, just has a shortened range, basically. Um, so there's no crossbows, but there are like super crossbows, which are rapid fire weapons, which allow you to. Actually, I guess the rapid fire weapon is like the new. New the bow. new crossbow yeah but literally like only one one of the units right of the, your list right so of your warband can take this heavy weapon right so so i don't know if you were saying this podcast enough you can basically take four guys with better weapons or yes so yeah so you have four guys who are like normal guys and then you have four guys who are specialists mm -hmm. who can take all the fancy gear right so your four guys are not the the four non fancy gear guys are not necessarily bad, mm -hmm. but they don't have the fancy gear, right? And they do have slightly worse stats, right? But it's really about their fancy gear, and but the fancy gear ma matters a lot more. So like unlike in uh, Frostgrave, where it's really you take a normal guy or you take these guys who are really good in close combat and they're basically the same but really good. Mm -hmm. In Stargrave, the four guys that you that special guys you take actually are like fancy guys with fancy stuff. So you can take the heavy weapon, right? So one of the guys that you can take is a heavy weapon guy. <clears throat> he can either do a plus two damage shot or he can shoot against two guys. So you can do two shots uh, against two guys next to each other, mm -hmm. right? So then that's the kind of thing. So if you clump your guys, he can do two shots per turn, which is obviously very strong. But he's not the only one that can make multiple hits per turn. There's so also- Flamethrowers too? The flamethrower is my favorite weapon, and I thought it would be overpowered, and I still am not sure if it's not overpowered. Okay. <laughs> Basically, uh, you use a template. Like he uses a template. template. Mm -hmm. it, it is a slightly shorter than eight inches. Okay. Um, but it's basically a template, but it's a giant template uh, that um, <clears throat> when, you, when you use it, uh, it hits every single person underneath the template. Which is, which means that if you clump clump guys, this flamethrower can like hit four guys or something per turn. Which means, you know, if you if a guy's running at you with a flamethrower, you better spread out because he he will get like four attacks. It's like a fireball, basically. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like if you remember, yep. Well, Frostgrave, if you want to clump your guys up to get those combat bonuses, but in this, there's all sorts of things that punish you for clumping up. Yes, and then there's another one. So, so there's the 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 flamethrower, which is oh, not only that, but the flamethrower hits a whole bunch of guys, does plus two damage, and ignores armor. So, it's usually plus three damage instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On average, it's like plus three or plus four damage. It's crazy good. Oh, and I think it ignores certain types of cover too. It's like super strong, but. Usually it means, you know, to get the ideal shot on the flamethrower, usually means you're not going to be in cover, which means you can get revenged, right? And it's not like everyone can take a flamethrower, right? It takes up one of your slots. However, as much as I think the flamethrower might be overpowered, um, there's, a grenade there's one, yeah. yeah, the thing that matters the most, in my opinion, 
to changing the, the gameplay is their grenades and grenade launcher. And I think you need these guys okay. because of the smoke grenade. So a smoke grenade means that you can literally lay a template, which is like fog, right? It's like can a four you, inch fog template. So can any of your basic guys take this fog template? No, no. only okay. specialist guys, which makes it really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can take guys who are, um, you know, you like flamethrower seems busted, but you kind of need grenades because those seem busted too, right? Smoke grenades means you can't even, like if you lay the grenade, you can like shoot and then jump into the grenade to hide and they can't shoot you, mm -hmm. right? So suddenly it, it, it matters a lot. It adds a lot of depth of tactics. Like if you played, you know, when we play um, infinity? Uh, infinity, right? Smoke grenades really change how you play and you can't just bulldoze someone if they can have smoke grenades. And unlike in infinity, the smoke grenades last the full next turn. Uh -huh. You can literally hide in the smoke grenades to either advance mm -hmm. or to jump into to hide and then the only way they can dislodge you is run into close combat and beat you up interesting okay so it really changes it the fact that you know you can if you want you can take all guys with grenades mm -hmm. right uh, and then the other thing with grenades is there's anyone that has grenades has both frag and uh smoke, smoke grenades mm -hmm. and frag grenades are another way that you can punish people who who bunch up, right? In fact, frag grenades are in some ways a counter to smoke grenades. Because, <laughs> you know, smoke grenades, if you throw smoke grenades, you can run up and you run a whole bunch of guy into smoke, you can throw a frag in there. And it's again, it's a template that hits everyone underneath the template. With a grenade. Plus three, plus three hit. With a grenade and launcher you can, grenades, you can shoot people without seeing them? Yes, but you have to succeed on a roll, basically. Does that work the same way for the flamethrower? I think flamethrower. Actually, I, I, I don't know if you can flamethrower people. You might be able to flamethrower people that you can't see. Okay. I don't think so. I think it's just a I think it ignores cover unless it's... I think it actually, yes, it does work. Because I think it only... The only cover you... Yeah, I, I think you can do it still as well with a flamethrower. Okay. So I would have to check that though. All right. But yeah, so there's like counters to these things. But like... Just by those abilities, those those weapons, it adds a lot of strategic strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like he added enough rules to actually change, even though, you know, I'm not mentioning a lot of things that stay the same, right? A lot of the rest of the stuff is the same, but just by those changes, it changes the way the game plays a lot, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and it adds a lot more strategy than I was expecting, honestly, <laughs> right? If you think about how these things kind of layer on top of each other, uh, it becomes very interesting. And sometimes, you know, the best thing to do is, uh, oh, and and is to run into close combat and just do it old school, like Frostgrave, take three guys and just be a guy to death. So can you shoot into combat in this game to try and just like get around the fact that they ran into combat? <sighs> have not checked that. Can you shoot in for Frostgrave? It's probably the same. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think a you... random... I don't... Oh, well, maybe you can and it just randomizes. Classes. Yes. I don't know how that works with a flamethrower. Or... <laughs> Whatever. Maybe you just hit everyone. Who knows? I have to check that. Honestly, I'd have to check that. Yep. Oh my god, that would be amazing if you try to roast roast uh the enemy in close combat with your guy and you end up just hitting your own guy three times with your flamethrower. <laughs> yeah. Because they all hide behind the guy and then your guy gets roasted. That's so thematic. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It just it just feels very thematic and, and it, it actually works a lot. It works really well to um, to make it feel like uh, space battles, right? There's not a lot of close combat. Uh, the guns matter. And unlike in uh, in Frostgrave, I feel like your warband matters a lot more. Yeah, I was going to have ask, all these special weapons. Yeah, I was going to ask if the spells seem less powerful than in Frostgrave. Or if, not spells, of course, because it's sci fi. But I, I actually <laughs> think they're roughly around the same power level. But the power level of your individual guys is much more, they have much yes. more. Because you think about it, a smoke grenade mm -hmm. is like a spell, right? Yeah. Like it's like a slightly weaker 
version of fog, right? But right. literally one of your guys runs around carrying it and casts it every turn, right? Without yeah, it actually fog, going off. Fog is really grenade, possible, even though there's grenade less is literally a spell in, <laughs> in, in Frostgrave, but now some of your guys have a grenade, right? Okay, that, that makes sense that it's not that they're less powerful, it's just that everything else is more. Okay. It's, yeah. So uh, your leader and your warband are closer together in power levels. Yeah, actually, you know, in Frostgrave, because other guys don't have utility, right? Look, because your your normal grunts don't have utility, right? Mm -hmm. um, your spellcaster is going to try to your your spellcaster is basically stuck or, or forced into the line of doing all the utility stuff, right? Um, now you have guys with grenades who can throw smoke and then you have abilities to do fire, right? And, and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, and, you know, even just a normal hit can stun someone, which is some sort of utility, right? And stop them from moving forward or moving twice or something like that. Or if they try to move, they can no longer fire, right? Mm -hmm. um, because of that, all of your other guys, because they're more powerful and have utility, um, I feel like in Stargrave, the Rel like the pow relative power level of putting a gun on your leader who is now shoot five, right? Right. If you bu buff them up, they can be shoot five, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the strongest shoot, five. right? Uh, it now matters. It, it seems much more useful, right? And on top of that, uh, your shoot five guy can also uh, run around with a flamethrower. So they actually won't be on the front line because you, you need them less for yeah. you. To, so they more just get into the fray. Yeah, I feel like it, it's sometimes, yeah, it can, it makes more sense to take your, your frontline guy, like your, your, make your captain or your first mate, one of them be a frontline guy who's just runs around, super buffs his flamethrower and kills everyone. Yep. Uh, because your other units can do the support stuff, right? And you can have two guys, right? And each guy can have a different kit. So you can have one guy tool them up to be a frontline fighter and mm -hmm. then one guy to have the utility to do the, the utility stuff. And so maybe your frontline fighter dies a bunch more, but you know, you just keep bringing him back and he's just a really good dude. Uh, yeah. So, him. well, you hope that he doesn't die. Th hmm. This is the, the thing that's interesting is that, um, so your leader, your, 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 technically, I think the game is more deadly, right? Because you just get shot a lot more, right? Because everyone game. has ranged weapons. Yeah. Uh, but, your actual um, the chance of death. leaders, any one single person can be covered up much better. And specifically your captain and your first mate can protect themselves better than uh, your wiz a wizard and a, uh, uh, an, an apprentice because there's still basically the fog spell and the wall spell, right? It's called holographic wall now, but the holographic wall is actually, I guess, stronger. Actually, some of the abilities are actually stronger because holographic wall can go all the way across the, the table. <clears throat> okay. Wait, can fog all, could fog already go all the way across the table, or is it the thing? No, it's got it's got a range limitation. Yeah, so fog can go twenty four inches and be like, so the new fog is called holographic wall. Uh, it disappears more easily, but it could go literally right in front of their gun line, right? Hmm. And yeah. the other thing is. Uh, after you cast a spell, whether you fail or not, you get to move two inches. Oh, so, so you, can, you can jump, jump out, shoot, and then come back in, kind of like warp spiders in 40k. Or yes, times operate. Yes, exactly. You can jump out, try to li like in Frostgrave. Uh, you, if you try to jump out and lay that fog and you fail, because you still have to roll to activate it, and you still have to do the same thing in Stargrave, right? If you fail, you basically are dead because. <laughs> That your 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 wizard is out there and he's gonna get shot to kill and killed, right? Yeah. Um, in Stargrave, you can try to lay the wall, and then whether or not you fail, you can move back to, into two inches to cover. That's actually an interesting mechanic that makes it kind of operate like Infinity, where you can move your guy in Infinity in a circle, but then you're you've moved your say full four inches, but you're allowed to shoot from any point, so you don't have yeah. to leave the guy sitting in the wind. Yeah, but it's only for your powers. So if you want to use your flamethrower, uh -huh. thrower, you still have to stick your butt out right so are some of the powers then like gunshot sort of powers or do they stay away from those there are a couple of gunshot i think there's only like one gunshot power so there's one direct gunshot power there's a couple that affect your opponent 
But in terms of like just doing direct damage, I think there's just one. Okay. Otherwise, you just gotta use your guns, right? Yes, that sounds yeah. Well, I guess in in Frostgrave, the way your wizards shoot is through their spells. But now, if they're equipped with a gun, it makes more sense. They just become good at using the gun in the sci-fi setting. So, yep. And it seems broken if they could just shoot people and just disappear. That's not how gun a gunfight feels. Like it should work. Yeah. And so it just feels good though, right? Because you know all the utility spells, it makes the utility spells better than the gun spell, right? Or the, than just shooting with the gun, right? Because you can jump out, use your spell, and then move back in. Whereas if you try to use your gun just to kill the person, you're you you might you might if you didn't kill a guy, he might shoot you back or she might shoot you back and kill you. So it, it really makes your captains in some way a lot more survivable. On top of that. You have guys who can throw smoke to try to cover up your your uh, captain and first mate even more, right? Like mm-hmm. you don't want your captain and first mate to die, and you're like, oh crap! Uh, I just realized, you know, they might wrap around and, and shoot my my wizard. I'm gonna have my uh, guy with smoke grenades throw smoke on my captain so they can't shoot them, mm-hmm. right? So that really, you know, adds another level, right? And normally I feel like the smoke in a normal game might be, you know, too powerful to cover your guys, right? Because you, if you go first, you shoot and then you throw smoke on your guys. But again, Stargrave is not all about, uh, it's not just about killing the opponent. In fact, it's not, like I said in the beginning, not about killing the opponent. If you try to be super safe, you can be safe, but then are you going to be getting the treasures, <laughs> right? The point yeah. of the game is not to like not die, right? Maybe you took five, that yeah, your opponent took let's say five casualties, but if you are so slow to get to the middle of the board and get off that you didn't pick up the treasures, who actually wins, right? When they come off with three treasures and you don't. Yeah, because if you throw smoke, you're moving slower. And if you put down smoke, they can just run past you. Yep, so it feels like, exactly, they, exactly. They can just ignore you because you're in smoke, right? And just run in, or run into the smoke. They can also throw their smoke on the treasure and try to pick it up and mm-hmm. do all those sorts of things. So, yep. So one way we played Frostgrave a lot was with three plus players, just almost as a balancing mechanism. Mm-hmm. Is the game, well, the first edition wasn't so designed for that, but the second edition includes, a Frostgrave includes a bit more talk about that. Was Stargrave built with that sort of three? Yeah, it looks like that. It it basically mentions, you know, if you're going to, I'm pretty sure it mentions like setting up basically about how to do it. Uh, It's literally just blurbs, but I feel like even though Frostgrave didn't, you know, explicitly talk about it, like the first edition, Mm -hmm. the game basically works fine with multiple players, besides the fact that, you know, it slows the game down, right? It's basically like, an hour per person or something like that so with two two people maybe it's a little bit less right it, it's an hour it's right but like two people it's going to be less than two hours maybe like an hour an hour and a half three people it ends up being two to three hours and then four people it ends up being like three to four right yeah so besides the fact that it slows the game down a lot like it, it works fine so it's the same kind of thing i think okay. now, we- now to be fair uh, I, I've been talking through a lot of this. The only way that I've experienced this is through playing the single player missions. They released a packet, right? That allows you to play against a, against an AI. So I don't, I don't know actually how it's going to play uh, against real people, right? Yeah, because I get the impression that if you're doing more shooting, mm-hmm. but now if you're worried about an opponent coming from multiple fronts, it gets harder to take cover from them if you've got people coming from your side as well. <clears throat> Yeah, so it definitely says you're su- you're supposed to pack the table just like in Frostgrave, right? This is just because it's in space doesn't mean it's not a terrain dense game, right? It it still explicitly says you should pack in like even though everyone has guns, so technically you you're not necessarily outmatched, right? If if there's uh, if there's not enough terrain, it still says to play the game how it's supposed to play. You should be packing your table with terrain. Yeah, so just knowing the people that we know, <clears throat> most people don't have the terrain to pack a table. Mm-hmm. Like for sci-fi tables, I know you can pack a table because you've built so much MDF terrain from Spartan Scenics. 
mm-hmm. and I've got a fair amount just because I built so many crates, like yeah. huge crates. But technically, if you have an infinity table <clears throat> and you just cut the table down to three by three, mm-hmm. uh, you should have enough terrain, right? Because you infinity is already a, a terrain dense table, and then when you turn it down to three by three, it's even more dense. Yes, yeah, so I think if people are looking to play the game, they could probably look to a lot of infinity scenery suppliers mm-hmm. for that the futuristic terrain that's if they're you're looking for like cardboard terrain slash mdf terrain like the cardboard's basically usually comes it's not cardboard cardboard it's like pre-printed thick thick cardboard yeah yeah the the, so for uh actually that's one of the good things about uh stargrave right is that there's a lot of science fiction terrain out there and because of the setting of stargrave where it's it's in this post-apocalyptic but not, not as in like everything is destroyed. It's as in like civilization has collapsed and it's become warlords. It's like a, a war, like a, a warring states period where basically warlords have taken over different parts of, of society, right? Everything is broken down. But, and and the, the general working civilization has collapsed, but you, are, you have a lot of leeway on how the actual like um, warlord, controlled areas actually function and look right you can be in you know you, you could be playing in a uh you know a, a destroyed city in which case you can use a lot of um it's like rubble. games workshop yeah fort warhammer 40,000 terrain or you could say that this is just an area that has been taken over by bandits and it could be you you can use a lot of infinity terrain right which is a lot more pristine and 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 still intact right um, so I think that really, really works in its favor. And I feel like in some ways, um, space terrain is more common for in terms of buying than, uh, than medieval terrain. I think possibly just because like a square box makes sense and it's, uh, in space terrain and it doesn't make sense in medieval terrain. And a square box is much easier for people to sell kits to make, like a so cool looking square box. You can basically make it out of MDF and it'll look okay. And yeah, exactly. Flat, whereas sci-fi, not sci-fi terrain, fantasy terrain needs like that brick texture. It needs rocks. It can't be. It needs it's slanted not, roofs. Yeah. It, in general. It's not, it's not nice and like squarely built. It's all kind yeah. of cobbled together and fixed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you, you can't have exactly, you can't have just a flat wall, whereas, you know, a sleek science fiction flat wall makes a lot more sense with maybe just a couple of gribbly bits on it. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of MDF, especially from Infinity, that you can use. And even the Infinity terrain that Infinity sells, which is like like you said, thick cardboard, you buy a couple of sets of that, maybe two two sets of that, and maybe some uh, the, the the new expansion for that. And you probably and, and you put it on again a three by three table, which is the size of Stargrave. Even for four players, it should be basically a three by three, except instead of being across from each other, I think you do corners, right? Yeah in general, uh, or, or you could just do sides and each person has a different side, right? Um, yeah, like they say, it says, you know, you, it says like basically three by three and maybe if you use four or four players, I think you might want to expand to four by four, but like it, it says in there, you don't have to just use the three by three table and things will get intense really quick. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's really interesting, you know, like even though the game is more deadly, your ability to protect certain people is actually higher than it is before, right? Yeah. Okay. So again, you know, you're you're if you want to do a support captain or um, or first mate, uh, you can do that, and you can protect them with smoke grenades and stuff like that to make sure that they don't get killed. Okay. So it's interesting that way. But well, there's only one guy you can take that can take the smoke. Or your nope. leader can take it too. There's three, I think. Okay, and they're all they're all the elite choices, though. They're all taking yes. There's three different elite choices, and your captain and first mate can take smoke grenades, right? Okay. So if you need to, even if you don't have the holograph spell, holographic wall spell, or the other spell, um, hard force wall, right? You can mm-hmm. take, um, you can just take smoke grenades. Okay. So from our experience playing Infinity, when you look at it, the smoke grenades seem like they should be extremely like. A huge thing in infinity but often you won't take that many of them mm-hmm. but it seems like in this game that's much more important to use them as a form of defensive tech yeah i think you want at least one guy with them uh-huh. looking at the way it goes like 
I don't necessarily think that you should take all smoke grenade guys, yep. right? Because like that's probably not bad because you know they also have frag grenades, so they can do damage as well. But like uh, the other units are actually really good. Like like I said, the flamethrower is on another guy, right? So basically, if you see your opponent setting up some like good line beat on you, you want that one guy to just cut that line off. Exactly. Like if he's going to round the corner to a building where you've got a bunch of guys behind the building, like, oh, yep. better not let him get that rapid fire shot off from the side on me. I'll just yep. lay smoke down so that he can't, you can't flank me. Yep, exactly. Okay. Right. So it feels like, you know, you, which one I guy, think, at least one of that guy makes sense. And I think it, it's almost critical, but um, to have a balanced team. Right. So I suppose. But, you, you probably want a flamethrower guy or a heavy weapon guy or just the guy with a plus four shoot, which is just straight up good shooting. He's just like the, the sniper just has a plus four shoot and then you can take out your cool sniper model. If you have your cool sniper model, you want to use that sniper profile with a plus four shoot. So I suppose the difference with Infinity is that your smoke grenade goes away afterwards. If in Infinity it stayed around for both rounds, I think yeah. smoke would be like huge in the game. Yeah. But because your opponent just gets things open back up for them as soon as it's their go, that it's not quite as, it's not nearly as important as it sounds like in this game. <clears throat> yep. And, but then, again, if you th think about it, like if Infinity uh, taking smoke cost the same support weapons cost as an HMG, it really makes you start thinking, how many do you really need? You, you need some, but do you want to use all of them? Because that means that you're not able to take your HMG, right? Yeah. So back to what you're saying about like taking your cool sniper model. Are there certain ranges of models that seem like they're really well suited to play this game with? Oh, this is like the th the reason why I'm like, hmm, maybe I should play. Maybe I do want to play more Stargrave, and why? You know, at the initial point where you're like, well. Um, Yeah, because basically um, Stargrave, the setting, is about bounty hunters, mercenaries, an assorted. You're supposed to be a motley crew, right? Yep. Um, so uh, because of that, you kind of don't want everyone to look too neat together, right? When I'm thinking about it and I'm building my, my squad, I'm like, do I really want everyone to be like well-uniformed humans who all look like they came from the same forest? There are a bunch of mercenaries, right? Mm -hmm. Coming together. It almost makes them look too clean, right? You almost yeah. want, wouldn't necessarily want the, like the bad guys, the pirate fleets, maybe they have all the same uniform, right? Because they're, again, they, they call them pirate fleets, but it seems like they're more like warlords. Right? Yeah, so you're not going to go out and buy a box of like 10 GW models and be like, oh, this is my whole war band. There just won't be enough variety there. If you go up, yeah, for one. me, right? You can do that, of course, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, I'd want them to be a little bit different. So, what I feel like it's almost like a modeler's, like a kit basher's dream, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I wanted to have once, once I realized the flamethrower, uh, <laughs> flamethrower uh, leader it was super fun because there's also an ability that lets you activate two times in a turn, so you could literally move and then double flamethrower so if, if there's a clump of like three or four guys you literally did eight attacks in one turn and your leader has much higher shoot than the flamethrower guy that you can just buy mm -hmm. right because it uses the shoot of your attacker right the 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 specialist only has shoot two whereas most guys have shoot three right so it is lower even though the flamethrower is stronger but if you put the flamethrower on your leader you can have like a shoot of up to five which mm -hmm. is insane, right? So it sounds like a thing where you go and you buy all those weapon packs that are meant for like those third party kits that are for GW just to get mm -hmm. like flamethrowers, bigger guns. Yep. Stuff like put, that. Put that stuff on, modify yeah, them. Well. And because, you know, yeah. you, you can have, although basically everyone is basically humanoid aliens, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's basically humans, right? Um, you you could want to convert them right i kind of want to convert them to have like different looks and this kind of stuff so it's it's like how i imagined it almost like a star trekky or more star warsy kind of vibe right you so go and get like necromunda crews and just start messing with them yeah so one thing that i'd realized is it's the same thing with frostgrave right the fact that it's models agnostic 
And the fact that there's not faction factions makes means mm-hmm. that you can take you you kind of want to make a motley crew, like I said, of different kind of guys. I started looking at infinity models that were outside of my uh, factions because you can take whatever you want and just take and cool just stuff. take one. Like for example, uh, the Shasvasti. In general, I don't I I don't like them enough to have like a full army. But it's kind of cool if in my squad I had two of these Shazvasti looking aliens, right? Yeah, in my crew. Of, or yep. They're kind of frog looking people. Yeah, exactly. So like it it makes things look really alien if you know you have your human bounty hunter and leader with your like lizard man with a flamethrower, which is what I have now. I just converted a guy up to be my <laughs> to be my burninator. Um uh, yeah, so you you have that guy, and then you have some frogmen in the back, right? And maybe you have a, a an artichoke as well. So I feel like the fact that it's you're, you, it's this crew of, of of assorted people, and even the pirate fleets, right? It's pirates, so it's not supposed to make it sound so militaristic. That if if even the pirate fleets look a little bit motley, that mm-hmm. seems right as well, yeah. right? So it really the take setting pirate, encourages you to you take take pirates. You're like. They're yeah. just space guns. <laughs> they're not regular rifles. They're yeah. or they're yeah, or you could take yeah pirates, and then if you if you want to get fancy, you can like you said take the the plasma uh, pack like plasma gun packs from mm-hmm. that are meant to be used with GW and replace all your pirate guns with space guns. So now they're space pirates. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, exactly. That's the kind of thing that I feel like the setting encourages you to pick and choose what you want right it says you know what don't you don't have to make it them all look the same just do what you want choose these different things that's what we're doing right so my well that's what the setting is about so yeah because um, you could go and buy like one of those infinity action packs which comes with about 10 guys mm-hmm. and then that becomes your army with a, a couple of things swapped in that fit the theme yep. better. like you could do that i think before we were looking at actually cyberpunk red miniatures that are like the game came out fairly recently for that Mm -hmm. the miniatures on that are decently sculpted they've got some pretty unique things going on like that game's not about forces of 10 guys who are all uniformed it's about Mm -hmm. like more of a motley crew thing yeah yeah exactly so that kind of setting me allows you to go and take from wherever right you could i almost want to see my mix of uh infinity models mixed with my games workshop models some of like even super old school models mixed with like i don't know war machine right some more science fiction looking war machine models right yeah because some some like guys like signar and war machine is very high tech looking they've got all sorts of, like generator signar, uh retribution right the elves the space yep. elves very actually the space elves don't even fit in in my opinion, in the normal <laughs> war machine mm-hmm. setting, they make more sense as science fiction guys. Uh, yeah, so so I feel like you know taking those guys and mix them all together is exactly kind of what uh, Joe McCullough was thinking when he created the game, right? Mm-hmm. And it works, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, and people who really want to play their Star Wars figures, but no one else wants to play their Star Wars Legion, can bust yeah. out. The, you can make a Star Wars group. <clears throat> yeah, so just the entire thing put together i think it really is a custom like i said kit bashers kind of dream just throw all that kind of stuff together. and that's honestly why i'm like you know what maybe i do want to play this a little bit more just to you know i, I i'm not really playing any games workshop models but if we play stargrave i can take out a few games workshop models and throw them in so i you know i get to play with my models all of my different models right and that's why i'm saying even though I think having played, you know, some solo missions with Stargrave with this uh, support pack they, they they got from like I got from the website, so you can play single player just to get get the game going. Um, even though I I based on that testing, I think I like uh, Frostgrave more by probably quite a bit, right? I just like the theme and I like wizards and all that kind of stuff. Um, the ability to play with models that I haven't touched in a while is very enticing, right? Just for a change, right? Yep. So, yeah, that's uh, so yeah, that's that's basically it. Stargrave, 
I think it's great. Oh, and I haven't even talked anything about the spells. It's basically, yeah, it's you know, cool. it's just a bunch of fancy spells that do fancy different things. To support you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they're thematic. Like, I don't know what else to say unless, besides mentioning all the different types. Yeah. It almost sounds like there may be more creativity to it than found in Frostgrave. It's always cool in Frostgrave to see what people think of for what's going to represent their warband. Uh-huh. Yes. For the... Um, Frostgrave, you can do a lot of different things because basically, although it's medieval, you know, mm-hmm. you can you can model up your your warband in any kind of way you want, and and it's the same kind of way with Stargrave, mm-hmm. I feel like. So, is it more? I don't know. The way that we played Stargrave, uh, Frostgrave, like some people had lizard men, some people had orcs, some people would make their warbands out of anything. So I feel like it was pretty open too. Yeah. So I don't know if it's uh, more than Frostgrave, but it's definitely, you know, maybe if, even if it's similar, you can do so much with that, right? Yeah, I think so, because it's not just guys with swords. It's, you know. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, I find it, and maybe it's also because I got to play, like when I played Stargrave, I mixed like a couple of Games Workshop models. Uh, some orcs, my favorite orcs, uh, with uh, my Infinity models, and I loved it, right? Because we're in the middle of the pandemic. I haven't played with my Infinity model since, like, fall, I think. Yeah. So it just felt good to to take them out, move them, push around the board, right? Um, and and play, right? Break out the terrain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I've, so in the same way, you know, once we start getting back together after the after, you know, things hopefully start looking up we'll be playing infinity like real infinity for a while so maybe i wouldn't want to use my infinity models uh to play but i do have these games workshop models that for some reason i've collected a whole bunch that i never put on the table and maybe that'll help uh, give me a reason to put them on either as pirates or whatever right yeah. we've also got frostgrave to play too so many games to play i know there's too many games that's that's the one thing i'm like can i fit so i think stargrave first of all it's a really good game. If you like space more than Frostgrave, I think it, it'll scratch that itch and it will be in a theme that you like more. Mm-hmm. And the game, looks, uh, the game looks decently written. It doesn't seem to have any glare. And yes. Flaw. There's, from what I see, there's maybe there's a couple of things that are too powerful, relatively speaking. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I've only, like I said, I, I haven't played it enough. I've only played three uh, single player missions. Mm-hmm. right so I, I don't know uh what's unbalanced but again like not, Frostgrave, you can that's not unusual for first editions in first editions usually once the player base gets a hold of it and tries to really min max things something will come out in the very first edition that's sort of yep. a little too good <clears throat> but again you know that it's, okay. it's it's the same type of game as Frostgrave, which means you can play with three players and that can help self-balance the game yeah it's because be it's so much more not turn the game either so Exactly, so that you can talk with the people and, and say, you know what, this thing's a little bit too powerful. If flamethrowers end up being too powerful, no one's allowed to take four flamethrowers. Mm-hmm. Maximum, you only take one flamethrower in your squad, let's say. Or if grenades are too powerful, well, let's say, you know, limit that kind of thing. Or, or, or people can always tweak that kind of stuff. Yeah, we basically right? house ruled frost graves to keep the shooting down as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we kept the shooting down and, and uh, you don't have to do it anymore in Frostgrave second edition because it's already kept down, but like we did that. And then we also limited some of the spells that were abusable, like uh, jump mm-hmm. or leap, sorry. It's not called jump, um, right? So in the same way, you can do the kind of same thing with Stargrave. And because like you said, it's more just a fun collaborative thing. People are, as I've seen, more open to tweaking the rules. And Joe McCullough, whenever you hear interviews, he himself the, you know, uh, encourages people to tweak the game the way that you want it. So it's the perfect game for you. Like he is not, he's not saying, oh, you're playing it wrong. And he actually encourages people uh, to do this kind of stuff. Just like how he, he, he's obviously writing rule sets to encourage people to take all the minis that they would not put on the table normally. Mm-hmm. He's also really encourages people to tweak the game to the way that their group wants to play and because it you know comes from the top down right it helps encourage all the players like technically if you play any game you can in any miniatures game you can tweak it all you want you can use whatever middles you want you can do whatever you want right Mm -hmm. but when it comes from 
the guy who created the game and he's out there in interviews saying that it helps encourage the entire community around them to lean into that and actually do it rather than just you know talk about doing it yeah half the book's not about how to run a tournament <laughs> yes exactly mm-hmm. yeah, exactly if your book is about running a tournament then you're encouraging people to run tournaments right mm-hmm. and that's why you know games like war machine and and, and hordes right became so tournament focused because they talked a lot about tournaments right mm-hmm. and and you know balance and and buying new books is really important against workshop because that's all they talk about right you have to buy the new book and get the new army right that's that's core to the experience of warhammer 40,000. yep yeah Anyways, I suspect that with the Blaster magazine that Joe McCullough takes part of with a few other people who published through Osprey, that there'll probably be some extra releases through there just to, to spice the yep. game up. Future, I but... think there are already two expansions to Stargrave planned. Yep. Uh, I think one of them actually has a full... I think there actually might be three, but I think one of them actually has a full single-player-ready campaign where you can play it either single player or multiplayer. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying like in general, okay, so Stargrave doesn't come with by itself single player rules. The rule set that I said I was playing is basically a expansion pack that you can get from the Osprey website. It's Mm -hmm. called like Bounty Hunting. And it's basically a, it's a modified mission pack where it's, it's uh, you can roll up, generate some single player games, right? Just to like, it's basically, I feel like just to whet your appetite and, and or to, to be able to play while we're waiting to be able to, you know, see each other again. Yeah. It's uh, like a beta the, test of the future book. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's a beta test. I think the, the oh, future more like, already. It's more like a free to free to play like demo game. Yeah, I feel like it's it's just like to get people hyped about it, right? And to 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 do it. Um because I think I'm just saying why it's not necessarily like an example is because I think because it doesn't feel like a full product. Uh the bounty hunting thing? Yeah. Um it, it does, like it, it has full rules to generate. Mm-hmm. You know, I it was it was interesting enough for me to play three of them, three games of it, right? Yep. It's not it's, I don't think you could play it like forever, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but no it's ranger. it's quite good. It's quite no good. Ranger. I mm-hmm. sorry. It's no Rangers of Shadow Deep in terms of its depth. Yeah, and, right. There's not the same game story game. and campaign kind of thing that made uh, Rangers of Shadow Deep so engrossing or single player games so enticing, right? As as that campaign keeps on going on, right? It's one off missions doing bounty hunting, right? You're just trying to take down a mark. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so overall, uh, you have any other questions about Stargrave? No, I think for less hardcore and non-Infinity players, I think they might be interested in it. Uh, yeah, I, I do think, uh, to, to me, I feel like it's more of those people that, so I don't, this is um, a little bit outside of, I don't know, just talking about Stargrave specifically, but I feel like there's a lot of people in uh, the hobby space in general who, let's say, liked their science fiction um, Warhammer 40,000 models Mm -hmm. or space models and things like that, but just don't like Warhammer 40,000 anymore. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, Kill Team, I think, hasn't been doing very well for a while. I think that basically Warhammer 40,000 kind of let it die or Games Workshop kind of let it die and haven't really supported it. And the way that they're supporting it is trying to make it a stepping stone to Warhammer 40,000 as opposed to its own thing, unlike, let's say, Warcry, which is their fantasy version. Uh, So to me, um, if you don't want to play Necromunda, which seems like Games Workshop's version of, you know, a campaign system, I think Stargrave is right up your alley, right? Mm -hmm. And, and like I said, you can play with all the kind of minis that you want to do. I think that is really the key demographic people, temp demographic people that have been, you know, burned out from the normal kind of games and maybe they want to get back into it. They want to do it more casually with maybe a buddy or two, play through campaigns, build this kind of stuff up and just put on the table the few models that they were able to paint, right? Because, you know, we're bu- we have busy lives these days. We Not everyone is as, as obsessed with miniatures as us, where it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I basically uh, gave up most of my other hobbies 
right? So that I can do this, right? Yep, it takes time. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So if you, let's say you still watch TV and you still, uh, I don't know, games. play video games, right? Then how many models do you paint uh, in, in a month, right? Maybe one or two models. Well, Stargrave is like perfect for that. You have a ragtag mm -hmm. uh, band of, let's say 10 different models that you just really like. And every single time you put, uh, you paint a new model, you put it into your band and you kind of play, get together with your friends, show off the stuff mm -hmm. uh, and play. Yeah, no, I think it's got a, an audience made for it. <clears throat> yeah, and especially with the kill team not doing very hot and a lot of people, I guess, getting burned out on that. Um, I think Stargrave, again, I feel like if it weren't for the pandemic, I feel like it would almost be at the like perfect right time because if it were to have released like two or three years ago, or let's say two, two years ago, Kill mm -hmm. Team would still have a lot of, um, uh, what do you call it, glow, right? So people would not necessarily want to pick up another kind of um, yeah, sci-fi skirmish game, even if I think overall it's a better game, more fun. Um, yeah, it'd be harder for them to kind of switch over and try it out. Now that you know it's been a while, they have kept their, let's say their games workshop or other kind of models stuck on the table, uh, sorry, stuck on their shelves, then it suddenly feels like a really good thing to pick this game up and play with it. And it also, again, encourages you to say, hey, you know what, maybe I've always saw a couple of those Infinity models, but you know, Infinity is really a very deep game. I don't want to make a lifestyle game, right? Like play, play into, get into this lifestyle game. But if I play Stargrave, I can pick up a couple of those Infinity models that I really, really like, right? Like, oh my God, they have humans with realistic proportions instead of ham hands and giant heads, right? So now I, when I put, you know, my human model on the table, it's an infinity model and it doesn't look like it has some, I don't know, space disease. So you can do it if you play Stargrave, right? People won't complain when you put down this realistic looking figure, right? Or like this alien, let's say, I want to just take this one alien. Like I said, it's just, it's just fast or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, seems like a game for collectors. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Um, Not competitive gamers who want to yep. memorize lore, memorize stat lines, memorize missions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it, again, it's more narrative. So it, it's not necessarily super competitive. You don't have to feel like you're constantly pushing the meta, right? So it has all the benefits of, not all the benefits, but a lot of the benefits of Frostgrave, right? Yep. With that space theme. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is, I guess, I don't want to, to, to just gush about Stargrave, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, although mostly I am because, you know, like I said, I've, all, I've only played three games against myself, but they've been good. Um, I don't think it is for everyone, I guess, although I think a lot of people could be wooed if they came to it with the right ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so... There are a lot of secondary models like mercenaries that end up showing up. So I feel like more than Frostgrave, you need more than just 10 models, right? Oh I feel yeah, you like... have variety so you can switch out guys. Yeah. Oh no, I just mean like the pirate crews seems mm -hmm. like they come out, show up more and you could possibly have lots of pirates showing up. So, so so you might need more than just, you know, a wandering monster table. You mm -hmm. need an extra five guys or half a squad, right? Well, the monster uh, pirates, the monster table is all like a whole bunch of non-human stuff. So it's really hard to double them up from Frostgrave. Because <clears throat> um, it's easier to proxy a human, some other form of human. Funnily enough, some of the monsters are primitives, which are just primitive humans. <laughs> Oh. So you, you can technically use your Frostgrave models for uh, Stargrave, right? Some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, like you could fill out some of that table. Um, but there are like a whole bunch of, you know, there's a secondary table. So there's like the monster table, which is not actually as big, but there is also a, a pirate's table, which, mm -hmm. like I said, one of those rolls, if you roll decently high, you put on four guys on the table and it's so four it, mercenaries. So it does mean you need more guys. This Sorry. is just single player? <clears throat> no, this is on oh. certain missions too have, have pirates, yeah. Pirates will show up, cool. Yep, it's part of the main book, right? It's just uh, the bounty hunter things makes it faster, right? It puts it on that track because that's how it, 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 it makes people, like makes, makes the, the difficulty higher. Mm 
Yeah. So I do feel like you need more models, uh, which is, you know, not necessarily a good thing, right? It yes, can be good if you already have them, right? If you if you have like, I don't know, even like 500 points of Imperial Guard or something like that, or Space Marines, you probably have more than enough pirates, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it has a demand for more other models. Yeah. Yeah. Then- um, obviously, you have to like space, right? Um, but I feel like some people will be upset about what they perceive as the randomness in the game. Oh, because- even- even in the one-on-one mode, that some random things can happen to throw one player off? Yeah, um, because I think the amount of life and armor you have makes, like, like what we were talking about before, right? The amount of life and armor you have makes it seem like your guys are deceptively tough, but they are not. Like we said, right? It's like most people don't die with one shot, but some of the times they do when they get hit with a critical. And technically, anyone that gets hit with a 19 is going to be wounded, right? Yeah, I don't think most people look at the numbers unless they're comparing it to Frostgrave. They're just going to play the game and be like, oh, guys die. That's <clears throat> that's how they'll proceed. I th- but I, I think a lot of people complain because they're like, how, I had 14 life and then this one shot killed me, right? The 14 life, though, is because it You're needs to be D20. relative to the d20 exactly right it needs to be relative to the d20 which is why your life is so high if you rolled a d6 you would have like six life or whatever right and you would mm-hmm. still die like you roll a six you still die in one shot right or if, if you roll a five you'd still be reduced to one life in one shot but because he's using a d20 your life has to be at a, a high enough level that it looks like you're deceptively survivable but the game is really supposed to be you die in like sometimes like if you're unlucky, let's one out of 20 shots, you die in one hit. And usually it takes two to two to four hits to kill you. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it as hit points, suddenly people will think about it. Like it's just, you know, when people come to the game, they, they, they think about it. Like these people are so much more survivable. And so it, it's 14 hits. That's like, no, it's not 14 hits. Exactly. Exactly. No, it's not 14. <laughs> it's, it's four HPs, but it's that, that extra, extra life makes it a little bit more random what what happens right like a a system that would be more intuitive that anyone can understand is um uh let's say you have four life but you can i don't know you can roll criticals and if you roll a a damage you keep on rolling for damage right Mm -hmm. that would be i think in some ways more intuitive because they'd be like okay so i can die in one turn it's unlikely but there's almost no way I'm going to survive. Like, there's no way I'm going to survive four hits, right? Yeah, or it's just like, or it's like an armor save mechanic where you save on five and up, and randomly you'll die on the first hit. Yeah, exactly, so right? One health, you die in, you're probably going to die in like one and a half mm-hmm. hits on average, yeah. five plus. But yeah, <clears throat> but in this kind of way, you're reduced to now 10 life. Well, now your chances of surviving a hit are actually. Like you, if your life was 14 and you're reducing to 10 life, your chances of surviving hit has actually dropped a lot, right? So, so yeah, so a hit that, you know, 20% more hits will kill you, right? Versus 14, right? So I, I feel like coming to, with the expectation that this is a deadly game, you're supposed to die, mm-hmm. uh, will help people not get shocked and feel turned away from the game, right? having the proper expectations. And I think, like I said, because of the smoke grenades and because of, of the ability to dodge in and out, uh, you should go into the game thinking that your captain and your first mate, if they get shot, they will, can, will die, right? You should come with the expectation that y- you do not want your captain or first mate to take a hit, right? And if you do, you, yeah, you have to realize you are risking them dying every single time you let them get a shot, but yeah, at the same games, time, sorry, yep. Yeah, a lot of games have models with one health, so you kind of expect it because they have one health, but yeah. there's a whole variety of mechanisms before you get to remove that health where they have a, a random chance to get out of it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So like, there's a lot more ways to cover up your captain so that they don't even take that shot. You don't want them to get, take that shot, even though they have what is effectively, I don't know what you call it, a a two and up save or two, two up plus two and up plus a five and up feel no pain. You could say Mm -hmm. that that might be too much, but right. Like 
if your opponent rolls a 20 when they shoot at your captain, your captain's going to die. <laughs> yep. So with, with that in mind, you know, I feel like you will appreciate, can appreciate the game a lot more if you keep that in mind, right? And because of the, like I said, because of the more defensive tools, like you're, you're I feel like going in, into the game with the right kind of mindset means that you will feel, um, you shouldn't feel like the game screwed you over because there's there was probably something you could have done to not get your captain killed. Mm -hmm. So that's just uh, one of those things. So I guess I'm actually ending up gushing about Stargrave and I'm saying, well, if you don't like Stargrave, it's your problem, not Stargrave's problem, which is kind of what I'm saying, but you know, I don't know. Uh, it does make things um, harder, right? And the fact that everyone has more life means that um, there's a lot more tracking that you need to do during the game. Yeah, you don't just remove the guy once he takes the wound. You, you've you got to keep marking everything with dice. Yeah, and I use like D6s and uh, it's a lot harder to track them because, you know, every, if everyone has 14 life, like, like in the original Stargrave, everyone had higher, most people had higher armor, but but only one guy had more than 12 life, which means if you had two two six-sided dice, you could track their life with it. Yeah, you could often track it with D10s as well because when you take that last hit, you're probably just going to die. Yeah, exactly. But whereas in, in uh, Stargrave, because a lot of people have 14 life. In fact, I think almost every single specialist trooper has 14 life. Um, you will often be in times where, you know, you can't, you, those two dice are not enough, right? Mm -hmm. You got to put in, oh, that it's two dice plus one damage or two dice plus two damage, right? Yeah. So it's, it becomes a little bit, uh, I don't know, more annoying. And there are more status effects. Like I said, the stun thing is an interesting thing right to basically say you're limited down to one action next turn um there are but you know you have again you have to track it right so there's yeah. a lot more that you have to track uh in this game uh than in uh Frostgrave. uh so i think they make it feel more space combat-y and i think they're they're interesting additions but it does make the game more complicated than Frostgrave. okay yep um, and more fiddly. So yeah, that's basically it. There's a bunch of other details like that I haven't mentioned, but like that, that make the game interesting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the different types of treasures and everything like that. But to me, um, they're, although they're interesting, they're not going to sell you bes uh, besides saying, you know, it's different than Frostgrave, right? So, yeah, uh, that's basically it. So overall, first impressions, it's great. You should try it out. Um, but I still like Frostgrave more. Yep, I suspect. Oh, I haven't quite been sold on it because I'm more of an in-depth gamer and would prefer to keep Infinity as the in-depth game for my sci-fi fix. <clears throat> I don't, th yeah, I think this is a, more of a sometimes food to try out different models. Uh, maybe run a campaign at some point. Uh, maybe over like, I don't know, like over a, a couple of weekends or something like that, like a weekend, uh, like a full day, play three missions. And then over, I don't know, three months or four months, just play through a 10 man, 10 mission thing uh, with three guys. I, I feel like that would be possibly yeah, the way to play it. Yeah, if you've got a group of friends that likes playing like that. Yeah, to me, that, that's the kind of thing to fit it in somewhere. Um, but again, there's so many games that we, we want to fit in. Um, it, it, it does make me wonder where, where it's, where it's going to fit in. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not, you haven't been fully sold on it? No, not. Still, still <laughs> going to hold out? Yeah, like many games, it'll depend on what, who wants yeah. to play the game. Yeah, wait till uh, you see my cool converted miniatures and my warband. Maybe it'll get you mm. to try to of random miniatures from all different kind of genres. Uh huh. Yeah, and then hopefully that'll entice you because you're like, you know what? I always wanted that retro looking robot. I once wanted to buy one of those and put them on the table. Maybe I will then uh, play one of these games so I can just have an excuse to paint paint it up. Yeah. Those people exist, but they're not me. 
<laughs> you need the full army with perfectly color coded pants and, and and the same badges and everything like that. Fair enough. All right. So yeah, that is the my thoughts on Stargrave. Uh, if you've played a whole bunch of games, especially against real people, tell me what you think. If you have any questions, uh, you can hit me up. Again, I'll try to, to um, give you any kind of answers that you need and hopefully entice you into getting into it, especially uh, if we can end up playing. Um, that's basically it. If you... Uh, want to contact us uh, about this kind of stuff, you can uh, uh, email us at contact at diceovereverything.com. Yeah, or find us on Facebook at Dice Over Everything Group or Dice Over Everything for what we're up to. <clears throat> All right, man. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll hear from you. This has been Alan. Yeah, it's been Brandon. Bye.